Hello, everybody. Welcome to the training, learning, and development community. Happy Wednesday to you. We have another wonderful episode with Kara North happening right now. Um, and people are jumping in. Who are we, who do we've got? We've got Rolanda and Karen, Catherine, Nancy, Kelly, Ashley, Kim, Wardell. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for, for, for joining us this morning. Um, provocative topic, confessions of an ID hiring manager. And I'm really fascinated by this one. When Kara had suggested it to me via our Slack channel on tldchat.us, I was like, wow, that is... That is really, really interesting. And honestly, Kara, I didn't even know that you were at a point where you were doing hiring for an entire team. So I think that as we get through this conversation, a lot of like what I think I want to establish is sort of get some context for what your past experience was so that we can understand like how you've evolved and where you are now and sort of talk about expectations as well as answer any questions that people have in the QA, this is really going to be a conversation based episode. So, so if you've got anything that you want to ask Kara about um, being a, a, a hiring manager in, in for an instructional design team, please put it in the ask a question area on the bottom of your screen. And also I've got a couple of polls that I've put down there because I am curious as to what our audience is looking like today. Uh, those those questions are, are whether or not you're currently employed and have you been interviewing for instructional design jobs? Because we barely did any promo for this one, or actually Kara did one piece of promo for this one, and we've got we got a lot of attention. So it'll be fun to uh, to sort of move through this conversation and see see what the interest is exactly. All right, so Kara, how are you today? I'm good. Can't complain. It's Wednesday. So, you know, I get to use my favorite emoji on Wednesday, which is the camel. So it's always mm -hmm. good on Wednesday. Nice. Nice. So I want to talk about, let's just start out with who you are now. Like what, 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 what do you do? You have a, you just got a new job this year. Was it this year? Yeah, no, it was, it was this year. Yeah. yeah. Um, extremely fortunate. I mean, I know a lot of people, 2020 is really gut punched to them, but 2020 has been an excellent year for me professionally. And I'm very thankful for that. But I kind of made my mind up at the beginning of 2020 because uh, previously I worked at the Ohio State University and I was finishing up my doctorate and I'd got all my courses done. I was going to finish in May. And I made the decision I knew I wanted to go back into corporate. So before I was at Ohio State, I was an instructional designer at Amazon and I knew I wanted to get back into a corporate environment. So I made the decision that I was going to be searching. And then I was very fortunate to have two really attractive job offers. And I ended up selecting the organization I'm currently at because I am building everything from the ground up. So that was a very interesting challenge to me. The other offer, it was already more of an established role, established kind of norms, established everything. But this role has been one that I've been able to define the entire learning and development department. And there's days that I'm like, oh my gosh, am I making the right decision? And I still am I still battle imposter syndrome like everyone else. But um, you know, I do try to think about, you know, what do the people in the organization need and how can I support those needs? So it's been a wild ride. I'm uh, four months in now and um, I'm hiring a team and, you know, being somebody that's been in this profession like my entire career, I've kind of ebbed and flowed like throughout different different roles. But I really saw a lot of things not to do, let's put it that way, if you're, yeah. um, you know, applying for a job. And I thought if there's anything that I could do to kind of share some lessons learned or um, have people kind of ask questions about what the process is like. And I do want to put a disclaimer. Uh, this is my experience. So your mileage mm -hmm. may vary. This is not, mm -hmm. you know, Bible for every place that you're going to interview at or everybody that you're going to talk to. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there before we dive in. Yeah. So let's, let's, let, let's, uh, why don't you talk about your origin story, how you got into instructional design, all of that. So we kind of know like what, what your expectations were to begin with, maybe even when you got your first job as an instructional designer, what that hiring process was like. <clears throat> and now you're on the other side. 
Right. That's so boring, Luis. Nobody wants to hear that. Um, so I, I'm like a lot of people. I, I fell into this profession. I didn't know that it was it was a thing. And I started my career in a call center because I could not find a job because I graduated undergrad in the recession. And I absolutely hated it. But I got promoted pretty quickly. And a small little role of that was training. And I remember after I did the first training class, I like went home, told my parents, like, that's what I want to do the rest of my life. It was very serendipitous. So I stayed at that role for about another year. And then Amazon was in the same town that I worked at. They built this huge customer service center. And then we had all of our best people leave in droves. Amazon had a very attractive referral bonus at the time. So they threw my name out there as somebody that they may want to get. So went over to Amazon, started working in Kindle, um, did customer service, did stand up training until one day I asked my supervisor who writes this material because all the material was created and he's like oh that's the instructional design team and uh we're gonna have a position here is that something you'd be interested in i said sure and so that's how i became an instructional designer at amazon i didn't go through three different layers of interviews i didn't submit an application it was very kind of organic but you have to remember this was 2010 uh, okay. when this happened. So I think the organization has doubled, if not tripled in size since I was there. I was actually reflecting on that the other day. It's like, I just can't believe how much Amazon continues to grow. So um, that's how I became an instructional designer. Most of my team was global. So we had another one in the center that I was at and then um, had them all across North America, you know, Europe, Asia, all over the world. And my boss was in Seattle. So that was really neat. And I got to go out and see her and and then she would come out to see us and it was it was really cool and then i fell in love with a guy in ohio and then got imported up here and when i moved to columbus because i didn't know instructional design was a thing my bachelor's in journalism i thought i'd really like to go back to school and get my credentials so i took a job at ohio state because a benefit is they have free tuition so i got my master's in adult education done very quickly and i said hey do you all pay for phd they said yes and so i am I'm currently a PhD candidate in learning technologies. And if I ever get spare moment, I will finish my dissertation, but yeah. hoping to be formally done with that probably uh, next early next year. Awesome. Awesome. Now that process, like your experience getting hired back then, how different is it from what you're doing now? Oh, like just from the decision-making process that, or even just the, the systems and, and, and the way that things worked, in, in your two prior roles, now that you're seeing it from this side, how different is it for you? So different. Um, I mean, I had the advantage in my other roles that, you know, I bounced around a lot internally. So I bounced around a lot internally at Amazon and I bounced around a lot also at Ohio State. I want to say the end of the day, so I was there seven years, had six different job titles in three different departments. So I get bored very easily. I, I do something and I'm like, I want to move on. I want to try a new challenge. So I was able to bounce around. So the internal systems is something that I was, I'm not really privy to in my current role because you have to remember, this is the first time that my organization has had a formal training department. And mm -hmm. so there's really nobody right now that is interested in kind of doing that or bouncing around. Now, maybe in the future they may be, but you know, I, ha I didn't have an internal talent pool to pull from, unfortunately right now. So really having to rely a lot on external and as I'm sure a lot of you know here in the chat, you post a job position, there are hundreds of applicants. And so when I started this whole process, I was very, you know, talking to our HR folks. I said, you know, I want to be really involved in this because I want to pick like the perfect person, you know, and I had all the intention of, you know, going through every application, looking at everybody's resume. But then I forgot like, oh yeah, I actually, do work during the day and I have a lot of things that I have to do. And currently I have 21 training projects on my plate, um, not even kidding. And I am not only managing those projects, but I'm the person executing and building, I'm doing everything right now. So to say that I'm stressed is just a, maybe a little bit, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, to that point, I had all the intentions in the world to, to go through everything, but I, I just didn't have time. And then, you know, the, our HR team was like, oh my gosh, look, we have this many applications. And, you know, I was just like dumbfounded that, that many people wanted to work 
on a team with me. I was like, oh my gosh, these people want to work with me or they're interested in our company. That's so cool. But um, so I think the first thing that I'll do to demystify again, this is my organization, your mileage may vary, is uh, the first layer you have to get through is that recruiter. Uh, that recruiter is the person that is funneling through and sending stuff my way. So the way that it worked with us is the recruiter would find a resume for me. And then uh, after she would call them, so she would find a resume, then do the phone screen. And then only if after the phone screen, she felt you were viable, then it, the resume came to me to look. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of the process that, that we did with that. And um, some interesting things happened. <laughs> yeah. How about the function of the recruiter? What's that been like for you, like relating to that recruiter? Uh, good question. So I have to say, I have a really newfound respect for recruiting. I, I think that that's a very difficult job for anyone to do. And I don't know how they get through everything that they have to do in a day. But one thing that I really appreciated about ours is uh, before this even started, she wanted to have a conversation. She's like, listen, Kara, I don't know anything about learning and development. What are some red flags? And what are some things that you are looking for? If somebody says something, what are some things that I need to be aware of? And so I'm sure if you all know me, what were some of the two ones I said? I said, they better not say anything about learning styles. I don't care about their Myers-Briggs. You know, I said, if any of that comes up, like just filter them out, you know? And uh -huh. so that was something that I told her that I didn't really care for, but um, I really appreciate that. So she really wanted to get to kind of know what, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and learn a little bit more about the profession to make sure that she was um, really looking for the right ones. And then also we did partner with another um, consulting firm, if you will, to also help find candidates for us too. So it wasn't just our organization, but it was another organization that we partnered with to also filter and find candidates. Wow. Just so, so that we know how many, how many instructional designers on your team? I uh, currently only have one other one, but um, probably by the end of 2021, I estimate I'll have five to seven. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going through that process right now. Is that, is, is it like, do you look, just look at your inbox and you have all of these candidates that are sort of like, you know, lined up inside of uh, in, inside your email or how does it work? No. So like I said, it filters through the recruiter. So uh -huh. um, I'm very thankful for that because I'm one of those inbox zero kind of people. I cannot stand the notifications in my inbox at all. So um, it doesn't filter through un unless it goes kind of like through her. So, um, but that is another thing I'll put out there. I did post the position on LinkedIn. So once mm -hmm. it was live, I posted it on LinkedIn, Twitter, and then like my personal Facebook. And uh, I got some really interesting responses. So I actually had people send me their resume and ask me to apply to the job for them. And I was like, no, that's not how this works. Um, I had some people say, well, I submitted my resume. When, are we, when am I going to get an interview? And I'm like, no, that's not how this works. And I don't know if it's just because they felt like comfortable with me or if they didn't really think about it, but that was a complete turnoff for me because I just, I didn't have time to respond to everything. And I've actually, after this whole thing, I've even put like a little disclaimer on my LinkedIn, like, give me 48 hours to respond to your messages. Cause I just can't keep up with everything anymore. Yeah. So are you just, do they just set up the, um, the interview process for you and you just have to be there? Correct. Yeah. So the recruiter took care of all of that oh. for me. So after I looked at the resume and I did also ask for a portfolio and then I got some pushback, there was two candidates specifically I can think of. One had a really great resume and then I asked for a portfolio and I guess they pushed back and said, well, I don't have one. And I was like, mm. well, but on the job description, it says you must have a portfolio to be considered for this role. And so I thought, well, you know, I, if you're going to be like that and then I'll, you know, push you away. So uh, disqualify that one. Another one um, had a really nice portfolio. And this is another little pro tip I'll put out there. Um, you know, the organization I work for. Let me put it this way. My non-disclosure agreement is way more robust than what I had at Amazon, where I work in a very competitive space. And so this person's portfolio, they had done some work in the aerospace um, department and they had full plans of various machines at their former organization. 
out there on their portfolio. And that mm. was a big red flag for me because I knew that if I hired that person, they worked on something proprietary for us, they put it in their portfolio, it would be my head on a platter. And that wasn't a risk that I was willing to take for that person. So even if you have permission um, to share something, I, I really recommend candidates to put that explicitly somewhere or have some kind of a contact information or something where someone can verify that. Um, you know, I would prefer you not have anything proprietary in your portfolio. I just think that's a good, good move altogether. There's all these different ways you can build portfolio artifacts nowadays, the Articulate e a Heroes challenges, uh, Chris and Anthony's go design something.co. There's all these places you can go and get inspiration from. So for me, um, that, again, that's a pet peeve. I know how other people feel about it. This is how I feel about it. When people are like, well, I don't have a portfolio because it's proprietary. Um, I, I just think that's an excuse. That's just the way I, I take it. Let me ask you about that person that, that didn't have the portfolio. So that, that actual application got past the recruiter though, right? Correct. So the way that we worked it is, you know, she would screen and then if the screening went well, then uh, I would get the resume. And then if I liked the resume, then she'd ask for the portfolio. It was typically how it was. So we okay. didn't get the portfolio front, front end. Right. Right. So, I mean, if, if, if the job description says, Re portfolio required should somebody even try to apply do you think um, if they don't if have you, a portfolio i think it's risky i mean you yeah. know for me and i know joe suarez talked a lot about this on his series on here but mm -hmm. you know i didn't want to be that organization or employer that asked somebody to jump through five fiery hoops to get a job um i didn't give somebody a work assignment i wanted to see the robustness of their portfolio and then in the interview process be able to ask them about it and uh you know i, di I didn't want to do that because i do feel there are organizations out there uh, for better or for worse maybe getting some free work out of it right giving somebody some actual work at the business and seeing how they they do it and i didn't want to do that and i didn't want to be off-putting and plus i'm also sensitive to a lot of people have access to the e-learning softwares through their previous organizations and i know that's a heavy lift for a lot of people if they're not currently in work or out of work you know to have like you know articulate or adobe captivate on hand so um i thought that that was the best way to be kind of fair about it but mm -hmm. again that's just my own personal uh perspective right right yeah, no, and it's it's a worthy discussion to, to you know just sort of talking about that. Even the tips that like Kristen and Jennifer are offering in chat about you know replacing text for something that might be proprietary like in your portfolio. Um, we should probably have a future discussion about that one because that, that that could probably be pretty helpful. So far, a lot of questions in the ask a question area. We've got eleven, so we're gonna have to um, we'll 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 try to spend a good amount of time on those. But uh, let's just keep going with a few of these other questions that I have for you. So, so far, what's the most surprising thing that you've that you've experienced as a hiring manager? Oh, most surprising thing. Um, I had somebody who was extremely sexist. I interviewed. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, in a very roundabout way, made it very clear that they didn't want to work for a woman. So that was mm. interesting. How about didn't in expect the that. right? <laughs> in 2020 how about in the process itself like your expectations in the past and how you may have looked at people who've hired you back you know your previous couple positions but now standing on this side anything surprising to you that you've noticed sure i think that uh two things one i think that a lot of people are nervous in the process so I always, you know, give the candidate a benefit of the doubt when they're interviewing because I remember I would also get really nervous when I interviewed. So if they talk fast or, you know, that kind of stuff, I would kind of throw them a bone and I would say, hey, could you just explain that again? Or can you explain a little bit more about that? So I think that that is surprising that I think everybody gets nervous, um, no matter right. kind of how seasoned you are. Um, and then the other thing too is just the examples that people pull from are really surprising. A lot of the examples that come up in interviews that I've been a part of um, aren't actually from their organizations. A lot of times they pull from, you know, volunteer experiences. I got a lot of stories about, you know, people's involvement in ATD chapters and, you know, things like that. So I, I, I was really kind of surprised by that. But then on the other hand, 
as a hiring manager, I love seeing people who are involved in the profession. I think that, you know, that shows that you are kind of owning your own professional development and you're walking the walk being a lifelong learner. So um, I, I got a lot of examples like that. And I thought that that was that was good. How about a pro tip for somebody like that is going into the interview process? Like I saw earlier, there was somebody who has an interview today in the chat. <gasps> Is there anything that you can um, that you can suggest to help with that anxiety? Yes. So the big pro tip that I'll give is, and again, your mileage may vary, but many organizations do what's called structured interviews, meaning the questions that you get are going to be the exact same questions the other candidates get. So really think about how you can stand out, but then also be consistent in your answering. So a technique that I learned when I was at Amazon, and then I, I you know, really encourage other people to use as a star method. So whenever people ask you a question, think about like what was the situation or task, what was your action and what was the result? And if you actually even preface it as saying, you know, the situation was blah, 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 you know, the action that I did was blah, 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 and the result was blah, blah, blah. I think that it also helps the people that are in the interview taking the notes to kind of remember. And so as they go through at the end of the process, at least for us, we all met and we just individually ranked the candidates uh, based on what we did. And it was a blind ranking. So I had no mm -hmm. idea what my colleagues kind of thought. Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely say that, you know, be very specific in those answers because they will be compared. Other pro tip. And again, this is another your mileage may vary. Even if the panel does not like you, at the end of the day, it's the hiring manager's final call. So if you impress the hiring manager and they want you, they can pick you. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. love it. Wardell has a great, uh, a, a great post here. I think the most important thing to be aware of when one interviews is that the recruiting team, hiring managers are generally rooting for you. Very true. Um, yeah, I yeah. I, you know, you want anybody who needs a job to have a job, right? And yeah. I really stink at telling people no. I am not good at it at all. So, you know, your heart goes out for the people that didn't didn't make the cut. And then, you know, that they got their hopes up and they gave their time to be there. And so you always wish them the best. But unfortunately, you you can usually only pick one. So, so this process so far, was it? more difficult than you expected or easier than you expected? Oh, totally difficult. Totally yeah. difficult because it's really hard to sit there and judge somebody. I don't know how mm -hmm. else to put it. And, you know, I have my own biases and experiences being in this profession. And there are things that like I listen for, but at the end of the day, I don't want another Karen North on my team. That's not going to help anybody. I want right. somebody who has different perspectives than me. I want somebody who will challenge me on different things because that's how we all grow. I don't want it to be just telling somebody what to do all the time and, you know, it just being all about me. That That's not going to help me. That's not going to help the organization. It's not going to help us grow. So I really wanted to find somebody that I thought would complement my skill set, but then also kind of push in different different capacities. So that was very important to me. Have any of the candidates that you've been interviewing, have, have any of them done anything that particularly stood out for you? And I'm kind of mm -hmm. looking at that in terms of like a pro tip for, for, for other folks, if they're going into an interview, something that might, you know, just stick out. Yeah. Um, it was evident to me that a couple of them uh, did no research on our company or me or anything. And, and that's another thing too. When you talk to the recruiter, ask specifically who the hiring manager is. They'll give you that information. And I even told our recruiter, tell people who my name is. Like if they ask, tell them who I am. They can look me up, whatever. Um, you know, one person did look me up and said, oh my gosh, like I actually went to a Central Ohio ATD event and I remember meeting you there. And, you know, just having a personal connection right off the bat uh, was nice. And, you know, I, it was a, it was a good interview, but I think that that's really important to do your homework because it's not a one way exchange. You want to make sure it's a mutual fit. And so if you look somebody up and you're just kind of put off by them and I don't know about you all, I can usually tell, I mean, I can look at somebody's post like, yeah, I think we'd be friends in real life or, Ooh, no, I don't want anything to do with that person. But, um, you know, you, you can, you can tell, but, you know, don't just take something because you're desperate because there is nothing worse 
than being absolutely miserable in your job, right? So do your homework and really see if, if the person that you're going to be working with is a good fit, but then also see if the company is going to be a good fit for you. I think that's really important. I want to talk a little bit about the the looking up, you know, the background of a candidate. Now, there, there was a conversation I was having with Toddy about, about that. I think she posted on LinkedIn about how you should be sensitive to what your social media profiles look like when you're in the interview process. When you are checking out a particular candidate, do you go? Are you one of those types of hiring managers that will research their their social media profiles to take a look and see what what they've got going on? Come on, you're really asking me that, of course. <laughs> Okay. Cause I'm, I, for me, I'm like, yeah, I think everybody pretty much does that. I know that even for, you know, where I am on the team that I'm on, anytime we consider any type of candidate, the entire team is looking up whoever this new candidates, um, their social media profile. So that's really important to, to keep in mind. Have you run into any problems with that? Have you found somebody that's like, Oh, look at that. They are. Yes, I, I did. Um, so there was somebody that was sharing some of the things that they were building and it was really just not, not good. Now, at least with where I want to take the Oregon learning and development. And so I was like, if that's, that's your showcase and that's the best you got, then nah. Uh, so I really think about what you're showcasing on your your profile. Now, if, let me spin that, if the person said, hey, I got this tool and this is my first time in the tool or I'm looking for feedback to improve or something like that, like a working out loud spin, I would have thought way more highly of it, but it wasn't presented in that way at all. It was like, oh, look, I made this. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So this is going to be my last question before we move into the, uh, into the QA area. But when you are looking at your candidates, what do you think is more important to you is skill and experience or culture fit? Ooh. Um, I don't like the whole culture fit thing, right? Because just because someone fits in a culture doesn't mean it's the right culture. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan, fan of looking at it that way. Uh, for me, actually, what I looked for was uh, just proof that they are dedicated to the profession. So um, like I said before, somebody that really impressed me um, took on, you know, they were kind of freelancing and took on a higher education project. And in the interview, they said, you know, I took it on, I felt uncomfortable because I knew that this was something I hadn't really had a lot of experience in. So I decided to research. I reached out to my network and that's how I kind of got through it. And that won a million points with me because mm -hmm. I knew that person was somebody that, you know, I didn't have to babysit, but they were willing to kind of have that bias for action and try to dig in and get, get things situated. And then I feel like after they research, after they ask questions, if they still need help, I felt like they would circle back to me if they needed it. So that really impressed me. Very nice. Okay, cool. Let's get into the, uh, the Q and a area now. Let's see what is the most upvoted. I see one there with four upvotes. Ooh, here's a nice one from J rock. No less. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> what are the secret opportunity killers that job candidates don't know they are making? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, couple of things. So one, if you feel like you're kind of bombing the interview, I do think in the first question or two, I'm way more lenient because I realize you are a nervous wreck, right? Um, and so even if you're bombing, you know, feel free to kind of try your best to turn it, turn it around. I really admire that. So case in point, there was one candidate I interviewed that just tanked the whole thing. And I felt mm -hmm. like more and more they knew it too, because you could kind of pick up on their body language. They were sighing a lot. You know, I knew that they were kind of upset with themselves, but they just kept going deeper and deeper down, down the hole. So um, that person had some great experience. And so if they were able to turn it around, I might've changed my mind on who, 
who I potentially picked. So there's that one. Um, number two is, you know, a lot of times you feel like you have to impress, again, everyone on that panel. And while that is important to be respectful to everyone on that panel, remember, ultimately, it is the hiring manager's decision, again, at least in my organization. So, um, you know, do everything you can to impress that hiring manager. Again, had another candidate who was way more interested in talking to one person on the panel and then, um, you know, anytime I said something actually interrupted me twice and I was like, yeah, okay, you don't want to work with me. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Now, um, Randy Redman has a really good one that he posted on Slack. Uh, um, Randy said, he asked, I'd be curious your take on whether it is important to have a niche carved out in ID given all the various job titles, or if one could be okay positioning themselves as more of a generalist. It's a great question. So I actually wrote the job description uh, for the position that I, I hired for, and I was really intentional in the way that I wrote it. I know one thing that gets a lot of pushback in our profession is how do I get a job if I don't have any experience and it's wanting like three to five years of experience for an entry level. So I wrote it very specific. I put zero to two years of experience because I do feel like at least what I needed to start with is I needed somebody that I could hand off various tasks to. Now, do I want to grow to have somebody that can do soup to nuts, do the analysis all the way through to, to get a project done? Yes. So for the role that, that I posted, I did actually list it as a learning experience designer. Um, the reason I picked that is because I did want somebody that was comfortable with not only doing the curriculum piece, but also doing the development work. But with that being said, um, you know, some of the things that I put on the job description were kind of wish lists. So I don't feel like you always have to have everything on a job description. So if you're kind of on the fence and you're like, oh, am I really good enough to apply? Yes, apply. Let somebody else make that determination that you're not good enough. I mean, that's the way that I feel about it. But definitely, I think that there is um, a, a huge uh, market for somebody who is a generalist. But for the niche, I do think that if you only focus solely on, like, let's say you want to be a developer, you may be a little bit more limited unless you have comparable chops in the curriculum development space um, to get some maybe more general roles. I wonder if you could, if you're a generalist, if you could, rather than stating that you're a generalist, maybe pick out specific skill sets according to the actual job that you're applying for. Like if they are looking for somebody that is an e-learning developer and you have some e-learning skills, rather than saying that you're a generalist, focus on your e-learning skills. And then, you know, and versus like if, if a job was looking for a curriculum developer, you know, focus on that and then put the, uh, the, the e-learning stuff on, on, on the back burner, I guess um, that, that might help too, I would think. Yeah, you actually bring up a, a good point that I, I forgot to mention. So um, if you can, uh, it would be good to kind of have some artifacts for your portfolio kind of in your junk drawer to pull out for specific roles. So um, for the role that I hired for, I wanted someone with storyline and Camtasia experience specifically because that's what we use in my organization. And uh, one portfolio had no samples of either but yet on their resume had a ton of experience saying that they were experts in it, but I didn't see it in the portfolio. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, but if you say you're an expert in this, why isn't it on your portfolio? So yeah. um, that was something that was kind of like a, a red flag for me. And I just felt like that person just had this general, maybe resume, general kind of portfolio. So if you can really highlight some examples uh, that you think would be really good for that organization based on the job description. And if you've kind of taken the time to, to create craft out some of these pieces for your portfolio, you should be able to interchange them pretty decently. Right. Yeah. Make sure you can back it up. Um, okay. Wardell Keith Pomeroy has a great question. The last two jobs I've had, I've had required creation of a presentation. Are there tips you would give to someone who is preparing a presentation for their interview? Well, that's mm -hmm. my nightmare. <laughs> I kind of want to bring Joe Suarez in on this one. Cause I know this is a, a peeve of his. Um, for me, I, I, I want somebody that has some personality. So bring yourself into it. I know that sounds really cliche, but after talking to so many people and, and thinking about the resumes and candidates I talk to, there's so many that have just kind of blended 
blended in, sadly. So, um, you know, some of the stories that I remember were pretty, pretty colorful. Um, so just, I think, be yourself. Two, um, if you can, again, this is this is a little bit of heavy lift depending on the org, see if you can pull in and like look at their website, see if you can pull in maybe some of their color schemes or some something to show that you've done a little homework on the organization, I think is also really good. Um, and then three, another thing, uh, you should have access and maybe they could at least give you some feedback on, you know, if you could at least have, be privy to the evaluation criteria that they're looking for. So I know a lot of people when they get rejected from jobs, I don't feel like enough people ask for feedback. I know sometimes people are scared and organizations are scared to give that feedback to people, but um, you know, see if they'll at least throw you a bone and, and give you at least a little bit of what they're looking for. And maybe that could also help you tailor your presentation because don't assume anybody else asked for it. You would be surprised how many people don't ask for feedback. Don't send any letters thanking anybody for anything. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, good stuff. Um, Nancy Giard Hawthorne, she's asking, what is most important to you when you look at a portfolio? Hmm. Uh, I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I want to see that there's some demonstration or proficiencies, if you will, of what I'm looking for in that job post matched with the portfolio. Because again, I, unless like I'm hiring a senior member of the team or something, I, I just don't feel right about asking somebody to do homework because again i do i'm very sensitive to the fact of the cost of things um in our in our profession i know that it's a heavy cost and especially if people are out of work the last thing i want to do is ask them and then you know they're signing up for their fifth articulate free trial or something and they got five different email you know i don't want to i don't want to put somebody in that that situation so i think that is a big one another one is i like to have a little bit of a story behind your artifact so don't just give me an artifact fact, but I'd love to know a little bit about, you know, who'd you create this for? Um, what was kind of the, the performance problem that you were trying to solve? And even better bonus tips, if I could even see if you did a storyboard, what did, well, how do you do your storyboards? What do those look like? Um, you know, did you create your own graphics? What's your process look like for that? So give me a peek under the hood of your, of your process in your portfolio. I think that that's really compelling too. And I don't see enough enough of that one portfolio I looked at that I really enjoyed. It was very meta. It was built in articulate rise. And then it had different subsects of, you know, different tools and different kind of things that they solved. And so I could go through kind of like chapter by chapter in the rise and see like examples of Camtasia, examples of Captivate, examples of, you know, uh, transcribing something. So there's all these different examples of things. So I was able to really sort through a lot um, of that. That and I was really impressed with that. Yeah, that sounds really impressive. What happened with that candidate? They may have got the job. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Michelle, kind of asking the same thing as that last question. What do you recommend putting into portfolio? But I think you pretty much went over that. Um, let's see. Tom is asking, Thomas McDowell, what value do you see in reviewing CVs versus portfolios? Ooh. And what red flags do you look for in either? Ooh, um, I feel like Tom's punked me here because this is kind of like a, a soapbox of mine. So um, obviously I, you know, I've done the education thing. So I am very kind of privy to kind of the CV thing, right? But I think that for CVs, what I'm looking for are, um, you know, evidence of, again, they've kind of worked in the profession. Again, I go back to, and Luis, you may remember this. Gosh, it was probably at least two years ago when Marco Facini was on here. And he said when he looks to hire somebody, he looks for how they volunteer. And that just that touched my heart. And that's something that I, I look for, too. I want to see if you're you're a good human um, end of the day. So are you you giving back? Are you volunteering? Because. Um, I hate to say this, I don't really care where you went to school. Um, I don't care if you got two master's degrees, a graduate certificate, 
I, I don't care. All I care about is can you do the job and, you know, are you going to be a good human to work with at the end of the day? So that's what I look for in a CV. I want to see if they have any different volunteer experience, any involvement with any organizations or how do they keep up with their own kind of learning in the profession. It's very important to me versus a portfolio is, you know, I, I, that's kind of backing it up. Right. So they're talking the talk, but then they're walking the walk in the portfolio. So I'm kind of looking for a, um, you know, a, a match between, between the two. And sadly, a lot of times there's not a match between the two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Tom had just replied. He said, no punk intended. I'm just <laughs> interested as I've just finished hiring and for the first time didn't look at CVs. Yeah. So well, I, and point. again, it's a, it's a good call out, but at least the process that my org did, I at least looked at the resume. I actually didn't get a CV um, for any of the, any of the ones that I got. So they were all, all resume based. Nice. Okay. Here's one from Dan McGuire. That's interesting. If you're a finalist and don't get hired, is it worth applying to the next similar opening with the same organization? Absolutely. Uh, it, a lot of times it is just absolutely splitting hairs, um, deciding who that right person is. And just because it's a no today doesn't mean it's a no tomorrow. And so I definitely think it's worth that. Now, with that being said, I shared, I think yesterday on LinkedIn, Brandon Carson had wrote up a thing about just how archaic it is applying for jobs. It is a job in itself applying for jobs nowadays. And he made the comment that, you know, you set up an account in their system or whatever, and then they, um, you know, will spam you with emails after you signed up kind of pouring salt on the wound if you you didn't get the role so i do think that that's really important um and if i can i i'm noticing the chat here on the side so uh i that is another thing too because i still am doing development work i i do know when something is a template pretty quickly um <laughs> it, people ripping off jonathan hill or a different template and articulate it's very very quick. I can tell it very quickly. So that is also a good call out to not saying you can't use a template, but make it your own if you put it in your portfolio. Yeah. And just for those of you that don't know what, what J-Rock is, is, is referring to, Jonathan Hill is just this really savvy e-learning developer that uh, participates in basically every e-learning heroes challenge that there is. And he is about, he's pretty much maybe the most prolific e-learning guy that I think is that I've seen because it's it's he just has projects just churning out constantly and and they're amazing every time he's just so adept at it so that's who Jonathan Hill is and he's actually Jonathan has been on on TLD cast a couple times too so um feel free to look in, in the archive if you want to learn more about him so here's this one from um, Kristen Hayden Safty that she posted in the Slack group. Um, one thing that I always wondered was what exactly are interviewers looking for or checking for during different phases of the interview process? That's a good one. I suspect the first and second is checking for skills and ability to do the job. And third have to do with fit with the company, but that's purely speculation. Also, how do the interviewers roles slash job titles <clears throat> relate to what they're looking to get out of an interview with the candidate? Uh, great question. So I will say, at least in my experience at Amazon and my current organization, any of these behavioral based questions that you get, like, you know, tell me about a time you had to have a difficult conversation with somebody. Nine times out of 10, I'm willing to bet on this because at least it's been my experience those questions align to whatever the values of the company are. So if you look up the Amazon leadership principles and you interview at Amazon, I guarantee you, you're going to get behavioral based questions based on those leadership principles. Uh, my organization, our behavior based uh, questions totally align to our core values at our organization. So um, as far as like the fit, if you want to keep saying that, I'm not a big fan of that, if you can't tell, but uh, you know, those are questions that, that we ask. So yeah, I agree. Now for my particular role, because I did rely so heavily on our recruiter to do the kind of the phone screening, I uh, actually only did one round of interviews uh, for my position because I didn't want to waste everyone's time. And so I did have a panel. So on the panel, it was myself. And then we had our uh, communications manager because what, first of all, this is the first job I've had where I've actually 
in tandem had a communications manager to work with, it's been amazing. So every training that we get, we put out, you know, we have a communication plan with it. And then after the experience, we've already built like drip campaigns. So people are constantly reminded about what they learned. So it's, it's incredible. I can't say enough good things about working with her. She's incredible. Um, and then the other two people on our panel, uh, one was our continuous improvement manager, because a lot of the training that we develop is based out of our Gimba and continuous improvement events that we have. Um, so training is often a gap or there's something that training can potentially fix. So I wanted him to be part of it. And then our other gentleman on the panel was um, a, the director of a really critical business function of our organization. And uh, Currently, in his business function, it takes about two years to onboard somebody because it's so technical and so complex. And so one of the big things we would like to do, you know, in the next year or two is we'd love to slim that down to get people onboarded quickly. So um, so for the panel, it was it was kind of ad hoc team slash stakeholders that were part of the interviewing panel. And then, of course, me. Interesting. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Here's a good one from Rolanda. In your words, what skills are the difference between an ID and a senior ID? Is it a matter oh, of time question. experience? Hmm. My opinion, again, my opinion, just putting that out there, my opinion. For me, an ID is somebody who can deliver a, a product. So that's a learning experience. That's a storyboard. That is a evaluation. That's a pick your poison, right? For me, a senior ID is somebody that owns the entire process from start to finish. And again, that's, that's my kind of two cents on it now. Do IDs do that in some orgs? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it also depends on the bench and the depth of your L&D team. But for me, I think IDs, you know, they can work with the SMEs, they can create the products, but they may just have like a smaller role in it. Whereas to me, a senior ID could be the person kicking that off, could be the one owning it, could be the one managing it, could be the one, you know, reporting the metrics out, could be the one, you know, doing all of basically making everything seen for it. Um, whereas an ID to me is, you know, maybe a part of the process, but not the full kind of owner of the process, if that makes sense. But as far as like years of experience, that doesn't really matter to me. Again, I, I just want to know somebody can do do the job. Um, for me, years of experience doesn't equate to mastery. Just because somebody's done something for 20 years doesn't make them a master of anything, in my opinion. Right, right. Awesome. Very nice. Kelly Roche asks this one, how do you assess a company for their ability to utilize IDs the right way? In, generally, in general, we want to use the skills, knowledge, and expertise we train for. We don't want to be order takers, jack of 50 trades, and shot down for every idea we have because it has always been done that way. We don't no. want the life sucked out of us. Our passion for learning and creativity is why most of us were called um, to this profession. How do you make sure the company we're interviewing with offers the right stuff? Oh, man, I love that question. I guess I, I feel you 100%. Um, I have a censored answer I'd like to say, but I would, I'll say that offline if you, you want to know. Um, I think the politically correct answer I would, I would say is, you know, a couple things. One, I'd ask, where does the learning function sit in the business, right? So if it's in an HR function, oftentimes the name of the game is compliance, right? They want to make sure somebody did whatever it is, blah, blah, blah. If it's in operations, IT, some other place, then maybe there might be, and again, this is just my opinion, there may be more kind of room for um, learning transfer, for autonomy, et cetera. So I like to ask that question. Where does it sit in the business? Two, ask them, what does their training currently look like? Um, you know, I got asked that question and I didn't like giving the person the answer because I didn't want them to be scared, but it's what I inherited too. I mean, currently we do a lot of PowerPoints and that's definitely not my jam, but you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And so I want somebody that's willing to kind of take these steps with me and, and help kind of elevate the learning experience in, in the business. So um, definitely ask like, how is it currently done? What does it look like? And then also where they sit in the business. But I think that's a really legitimate concern. Uh, there's definitely one um, 
setting I would not recommend based on that. But again, I'm probably not going to say that on air. So if you want to know, just send me a DM and I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, that was a great question and a great answer. You know, having been in this industry for as long as I have, I've come across the this same topic so many times. And um, and that was a great response, Kara. Thank you. Okay, let's see. We got one from Amy here. What do you look for or what stands out to you in a resume? Do they start looking the same after a while? Yeah, they do. They do. Um, I, I mean, again, this is my own bias. I, I like something that graphically looks nice. It doesn't have to be over the top, but if it if it's clean, it's got some kind of a, a graphic edge to it. I, I like that. Um, things I don't like. I don't like these and I don't know who pushes these out, but you know, you have your different skill sets. So let's say you have articulate storyline, Adobe Captivate. And then you have like this bar and like parts of it are filled in or you have a pie chart parts of it filled in. What on earth does that mean? If you're 80% articulate storyline, what does that mean? You know, if you're 60% Captivate, what does that, that drives me bananas. And I'm just like, why, what, do, what are you talking about? Either you are skilled in it or you're not skilled in it. Um, you know, you don't put sort of know what this is. Boom, boom, boom. Right. So I, I'm just not a fan of that. And that, that's a personal turn off to me. I don't like that. Yeah. It's the don't make me think idea, you know, just, uh, too much to consider there. Okay. So that's a good one. Um, Jennifer's asking, how do you handle your weak spots? The parts of the job description that aren't your strengths. Mm, that's a good one. Uh, here's what I say, Jennifer, if I had to do everything in this profession by myself, I would not be successful, right? And so the several people that are actually here in the chat are definitely part of my network. You know, I talk to Jonathan Rock, Jack Hutchinson, Jonathan Hill, um, Joe Suarez on a daily basis. And the reason I talk to them on a daily basis, one, they're like my learning and development family, but two, we rely on each other. There are things that come up in my day to day. I'm like, I don't even know how to scope this out. Can somebody just hop on and talk through this with me? So if you pose it as, listen, I'm not the best at everything. One, one, you're honest, right? You're not being this, you know, puff out chest, pretending you're somebody you're not like some people on LinkedIn like to do. Uh, but two, for me, I want to work with somebody who is dedicated to lifelong learning. And a lot of people say that, but it's lip service. I mean, the way that you show that you're dedicated to it, in my opinion, is by admitting, you know, hey, I'm not the best at evaluation, but I'm reading, you know, this book, I've been talking to these people, and I'm trying to get better at it myself. And then, you know, if I get hired in this position, I would also like to share what I'm learning with the team. Huge brownie points with that. Mm -hmm. No, totally agree. I think that especially in this industry, having those kinds of connections just really help. And the people that are successful in it you can see it. They're the ones that have kind of formed their own L and D sort of family. And, and so I'm not surprised at all that you have such a, a nice uh, group of experts to turn to on a regular basis. And it's one of the reasons why this community exists because we want to be able to help people make connections because it's so integral to, to, to the function overall. Um, let's see. Carol has one here. I have an interview coming up with a large company that I'm currently a contractor for. It is going to be a panel interview, and I know a couple of the interviewers. Is it okay if I contact them to see how I can ace the interview, or would that be inappropriate? Ooh. How about we? How about we do a, a compromise here? Reach out to them, and you know, tell them that you're excited that you know you have this interview coming up. But I don't think I would explicitly ask for tips. But depending on your relationship with them, I know I know if somebody did that to me, I was on a panel, they said, hey, I'm really excited about interviewing. And I had a relationship with them, I might throw them a couple tips that I think, right? And then that way, they're not the ones explicitly asking. So I, I would at least say, hey, really looking forward to, to our chat coming up and just see what you get. You might be surprised. Yeah, I think it really does kind of depend upon your relationship with those individuals. and and your comfort level with them and them with you. So um, good luck. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Let's see. Jesse is asking, I have a master's in educational technology, once labeled instructional design. I've taught for 10 plus years. 
How do I break into the corporate training, learning and development ID corporate world? Ooh, yeah. mm, great question. Yeah. And there's several people out there that exactly like you, Jesse. So here's what I would recommend. Get some project experience under your belt. Um, a lot of people are like, you know, how do I get this if I'm not, you know, in an organization right now or I'm not working? There's a lot of places you can look for volunteer experience. So um, I don't know if many, well, some of you know this, some of you don't, but I credit Louise a lot for my success because I got a lot of experience, you know, live streaming here, producing here, um, doing some community management here. I got a lot of experience that has really helped me in my career here at TLDC. And all it cost me was my time. So ATD is another place you can get involved at and get project experience. So specifically, you know, working with people, um, seeing if you can develop a couple little things under your belt. And I think that that is really what will help pivot you into the corporate environment, especially if you only have the academic credentials. I know time and time again, a lot of people that I chat with, just because they have the academic credentials, they know the theory, they can't apply it. They, they have the chops, they know it. They learned it. I mean, higher ed's really good for that. But if I ask them to build something, they can't do it. I, I have to help them do it. So um, get that development experience and some project experience under your belt. And I really think it'll open a lot of doors for you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great answer. And thanks for the uh, shout out for TLDC. <laughs> I never know how to respond to that stuff. But um, yeah, no, it's, I mean, it, it's, um, yeah, TLDC is fun. Uh, <laughs> There's a question from Janine. Do we need a portfolio? And if so, what should it contain? Oh, okay. So we kind of went over this one. Um, I'll skip that one. Uh, here we go. Karen LeGrew is asking, I wonder if there is a special area of work or instructional design, which also includes graphic design as a needed skill. Oh gosh, that's, that's a good one. So I'm i I'm mentoring somebody right now that is just a, brilliant graphic artist, plus also has a technical communication background. And I'm just dumbfounded that he hasn't been scooped up yet. Cause I mean, I'm just like, oh my gosh. Um, I think that you need to tout that that's your, your expertise, Karen, because I would love to have somebody like that on my team. I know graphic design is definitely a weakness of mine. That's something that I fully admit um, on interviews and to other people, but that's why I use tools like Stencil. Actually, Luis turned me on to Stencil and then Canva. And, you know, because I, I don't I don't think like that, but I definitely think that that is a huge selling point, specifically depending on the organization might not have deep pockets for graphic assets and that kind of stuff. So if you could create some of those for that organization, I mean, that's a double bonus. So I would definitely tout that as a an expertise that, that you bring to the table because I don't think a lot of instructional designers have that deep skill set. I think they they can get by, right? But but to have that that full kind of, you know, build everything, I, I don't think so many people have that. So that's really special. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would I would add like UX as well has been um has been extremely popular like within the TLDC community as well. We did a whole playlist on that. And it sort of even makes me think about the skill set that like someone like Devlin Peck has, which um you know, he just has, he's an amazing designer all around. So um, yeah, if you've got some uh, graphic design chops, you're, you're going to, you're going to do okay. Um, I like this next one from, from Janine. Um, do you always expect questions in an ID interview regarding learning theories, et cetera? Oh, I expect questions. Like I want somebody to ask a question at the end of the interview. Um, uh, yeah, I think learning learning theories might be an interesting question. Maybe something I would ask specifically is, you know, do you have an orientation or a favorite way to kind of scope out a project or something? I think that might be an interesting question to ask. Um, I also coach people on always asking, why is the position open? Um, because you can learn a lot just from that question. Are you inheriting somebody's muddy footprints versus is this like a growth you know, they're adding you because the team is growing because there's two totally different ways to approach that, uh, depending on that answer. But yeah, I think that that's totally an appropriate question to ask. But 
with a caveat, remember, there are a lot of people in leadership and learning development that do not have a formal degree in it. And that's one thing that I love about this profession. You don't have to have that formal degree to be successful. So just because it may off put somebody, maybe just because somebody doesn't know an answer or gives an answer if you have that theoretical background, you know, don't don't count that person out because just because they don't have that, they'll probably have the business savvy you don't have or they'll have the project management experience you don't have. And it really is at the end of the day about kind of that symbiotic relationship of the entire team to help get help get things done. Nice. Okay. We've hit the top of the hour, but we got one more question that is kind of um, this one I think is, is really relevant. And I want to ask it to you. It's from Patricia. What if I look overqualified on paper? I have a PhD, but most ID positions only require a bachelor's degree. How do I still apply? Oh, a great question. Um, I actually had this conversation with uh, Heidi Kirby because she's also working on her PhD. And she said, you know, I feel like I've gotten a lot of opportunities because I'm working on it. And I said, really? I said, that's like the last thing I tell anybody. I want them to see my experience and what I do before they even look at my education um, experience. So I, mm. I, I get you. I, I definitely think that that is um, something that a lot of people with the terminal degrees do kind of worry about. Um, but I will say at least when I interviewed for my position, um, they were very impressed by it as well, um, the, what Heidi said. And, you know, when I told them that I worked full time and also did it, that also impressed them too. Uh, and I totally did. But um, I, I, at least in my resume, the way I have it is I have my experience first. And then I actually my education I think my volunteer experience is even above my education on my resume. I mean, that's how, how much I, I put it out there. Um, if they dig for it, they'll see it. But I always feel like my experience is, is what matters. So, No, that's great. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that's it. We've got to wrap up here. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. <clears throat> hey, if, you, uh, if you're interested, please consider a TLDC membership. Um, would love the support and would love to bring you on and and even do a member showcase with you, have you on screen so we can learn more about who you are and uh, just bring you on to, to this L&D family. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. Kara, thank you so much for doing this again. Uh, great topic. Hopefully, um, this has helped a lot of people out there, and uh, and I think it will. And the recording will be available shortly after we close out here. Great. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone.